a preacher and a bus driver both were killed in a car accident at the same time. And they were immediately found themselves walking up to the pearly gates in heaven, all excited about being in heaven. And as they approached the pearly gates, Peter was on the outside there, and he greeted them and welcomed them to heaven. And he said, let me take you to your eternal dwelling places. Well, they were just excited, and they walked into the gates of heaven and down the streets of gold, mansions on each side. And there was this beautiful, huge mansion on the right-hand side, just down the street, just a bit. And uh, Peter said to the bus driver, there you go. He said, that's where you're going to spend eternity. And the bus driver walked up the stairs and headed into the mansion, just excited to be there forever. And Peter and the bus driver just kept on walking down the streets of gold. They walked and walked and walked till they turned from gold to pavement and then they turned to gravel and then kind of a mud trail. It was kind of in the slum parts of heaven. And there was a tar paper shack over there on the side and Peter said to the preacher, that's where you're gonna spend eternity. And the preacher became very upset and he said to Peter, what do you mean? He said, I get to live in this tar paper shack for the rest of eternity and you gave that bus driver back there that beautiful mansion? He said, didn't you know that back on earth I was a preacher? That guy was just a bus driver. He said, why did you give him the mansion and you gave me just this tar paper shack? And Peter said to the preacher, he said, you know, back on earth, when you preached, people slept. But he said, when that bus driver drove the bus, rather people pray. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you fall asleep this morning, you're going to uh, ruin my chances of uh, having a mansion in heaven. So please stay awake. Um, there's a song that uh, we used to sing when I was growing up in church. And there's a lot of choruses we used to sing back in those days about heaven and going there. And one of them was this one. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. And actually, I've asked Wendy Green. If Wendy, you come up to the front. And I want us all to sing this song. I've got a mansion over the hilltop. And I, I, I think a lot of you will remember if you're um, a little bit older. Uh, let, me, let me see. How many of you remember this song? Uh, it could sing it, okay? <coughs> Fourteen. Okay. So, uh... All right, Wendy, can we uh, um, give this a try? All right, here we go. I'm satisfied with just a cup of below. Word mansion 
is the one that uh, comes out of that verse. In my father's house are many mansions. Now you'll notice that in the uh, modern translations, uh, such as the New International Version, which I'm using, doesn't use the word mansion there. Notice it translates it in my father's house are many rooms, but it is used, for example, and this is where that song comes out of the King James Version, in my father's house are many mansions. The Greek word that's translated mansion there is mone, which literally means a, a, a staying, a residence, a place. And so and the translation uh, of room is somewhat accurate. It's probably not the best. Uh, actually, mone is a root word for monastery, in case you ever wondered. And so the idea here, however, is the fact of a hope of an eternal home. That's what it's talking about that Jesus is telling his disciples here. And that's something that Christians have clung to for centuries. Over the years, it has given many, many Christians comfort and inspiration as they face the challenges of life, such as funerals, such as, uh, for example, as I said, I was involved with two this week. Well, in our text, and I'm just going to look at the first three verses of John chapter 14, Jesus talks about that home that he has gone to prepare. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again to receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Well, this morning I'm calling my message in my Father's house are many mansions. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God that <coughs> contains the truth concerning our eternal destiny. And it's so wonderful to know that uh, we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear going to hell. We don't have to fear an eternity of separation from loved ones, but rather the realization of an eternal home with you and all others who love Jesus and have accepted him into their hearts as personal Savior and to be there forever and ever. What a wonderful thought. Lord, we, we cling to that. And as we go through the challenges of life and losing loved ones, we always remind ourselves of that a wonderful and amazing truth. And this morning I stand against all the forces of darkness. I command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. The Holy Spirit, I welcome you here. Guide and lead us into the truth. May, may we follow you exactly the way you want us to follow you. In Christ's name we pray. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and glory. Amen. Well, I was working on my master's degree at Providence Theological Seminary in Auburn back in the summer of 1983. We lived on campus, my wife and, uh, and our four kids and I, and we, uh, 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 there during the summer, spent the summer um, uh, Sundays going to a small Bible preaching church in uh, the town just south of Auburn, St. Pierre. St. Pierre Bible Fellowship was the name of the church. We got to know some of the folks and wonderful people there at the, at the uh, church, and we enjoyed our time there. They, could, they used to sing the song, Our God Reigns, just built it out. Our God Reigns. I remember that. That was just a wonderful uh, time. We enjoyed that. Remember one Sunday morning, we arrived, and uh, as soon as we pulled into the parking lot, somebody came over to us, and they said, you, you need to know uh, that something has happened this week. And he went on to say how that one of the uh, fathers and the one of the men in the congregation who had a, a little two-year-old baby girl um, had gone that week, he had taken her with him in the truck and had gone to do some work on the farm and then came back, took her out of the truck, put her uh, on the driveway, went inside to get something out of the house, came back, looked around for the girl, she was around, backed up, and as he backed up, he drove over her and killed her. And, um, and he told us that this has happened. And during that service, that was probably one of the most profound services I ever attended, the father got up and spoke, and he said, and I quote, there's a big hole inside of me. Something has been ripped out of me. But what's happened this week has given me a new appreciation for heaven. I can say now, I'm homesick for heaven. He went on to say, I have always wanted to go to heaven, but now I can hardly wait to get there because little Heidi is waiting there for me. As I said before, the thought of heaven has given comfort and inspiration to people going through tough situations like that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this question. If you don't have that thought, that comfort, what do you do in a time like that? What else do people do? I'll never forget hearing the story of a man in 
Stonewall, who backed over his little three-year-old child and killed it. Uh, and they said you could hear him screaming and yelling all over Stonewall uh, in the anguish of what he had just done. And unfortunately, this man, he later told me how that drove him to drink. It's the only option he felt he had. Thankfully, later in his life, he came to know Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Well, in our text, Jesus talks about that home that he said he's gone to prepare for us. And what we have, this the context of this, is Jesus meeting with his disciples the evening before he's about to be crucified. He's having what we call the Last Supper with them. And during that evening, and we've already gone through this text earlier on in uh, uh, March and early April, we looked at the uh, time when Jesus had the, the Last Supper and he washed the feet of his disciples. And we said this was a very unorthodox <coughs> thing for a master to wash the servant's uh, disciples. And we had said that what Jesus was doing here was using his life and what he was doing as an example of how we as followers of his should do as well. We should be living lives where we are servants. It's servanthood. And it was at that supper that he announced to them this disturbing news that he was going to leave them and to go where they themselves couldn't come. And he said in John chapter 13, 33, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so... I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. And what he's talking about here, where I'm going, is essentially the fact that he was going to die. And the fact that they couldn't come simply meant that they were not going to die yet. They would die later on, but not at this point in time. Anyways, they would be left on the earth for a period of time uh, to come. Well, when they heard the fact that Jesus told them that he was going to die, they were deeply saddened. And that's why in chapter 14, verse 1, the first part of our text, he says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. And that's what they were. They were troubled over the thought of Jesus leaving them and them being left alone. Now, probably as difficult as hearing the news that you yourself are going to die and you've gone to the doctor and he says you've got three months to live, I would think hearing that someone you love dearly is about to die can even be worse. And uh, the pain of losing someone you love is difficult, and particularly if it's a younger person. And uh, I have had, through the years, in counseling more than one parent who was had or was about to lose their child say to me they wished that it were them. They said they would gladly switch places with their child so that the child could live. And there is tremendous pain in losing a loved one. Uh, we uh, know that for sure. We see the story of King David when after his adultery with Bathsheba, the child that was born ends up dying and the scripture says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, that Nathan the prophet said to David, the son born to you will die. And after Nathan had gone home, the child that Uriah's wife had born to David became ill. And David pleaded with God for the child. And he fasted and went into his house and spent nights lying on the ground. And the child was sick and eventually died. And so, as I said, the pain of losing someone you love, in particular in the, in the context of, of a child, is so difficult for sure. But it's difficult to lose any loved one. I uh, uh, will never forget how that in the fall of uh, 2000, my sister called me and said to me, Henry, we just come back with mom from the doctor in Selkirk, and she has esophageal cancer, and they give her six months to live. This is a picture that I took of our uh, Christmas gathering at their place at the Stony Mountain. And uh, I remember my mother was so quiet during that entire Christmas Eve celebration. No doubt for the last Christmas that she would have with us. And I remember her, her telling me how um, she uh, was sad about leaving, particularly the children and the grandchildren. That was the, the challenge that she felt. And uh, she was troubled. And I remember the, the, the troubling it was to me even though she was, at that point in time, 88 years of age. You, you know, once she's your mother, she's always your mother. And I remember the sense of loss was for me. 
I want to say this. Maybe this morning you have a troubled heart. And perhaps the pain and the grief in your life is overwhelming to you. And maybe that's what you're going through. And if so, I want you to listen to what Jesus says to his disciples about their grieving. He told his disciples not to be upset at the thought of him dying. Let not your hearts be troubled. And the reason he said they shouldn't be upset, let not your hearts be troubled, was that they could cope with it by trusting God and him. And he puts it this way, trust in God, trust also in me. And what he was saying is that when you trust God, that's the antidote to the pain of a troubled heart. That's the antidote to the pain of a troubled heart. Trusting God during the tough times in life. Putting your faith and trust in that situation. And fear, sadness, and loss of any kind. Not just the loss of the life of a loved one. Any kind of loss we go through. And that we struggle with losses. Can be made a little easier. Uh, maybe it'll go as far as to say a lot easier when you trust in God. Now you may say, why? Uh, how, how's that, how does that work? And, and the answer, why it is easier is this. Let me give you the intellectual answer behind the emotional feeling of that. And the answer is because all manner of bad news can be coped with when you understand the truth of the sovereignty of God. Now what I mean by the sovereignty of God is that God is in complete control of absolutely everything that happens on planet Earth. God's not up in heaven and looking at what's happening down in the world scene today. Oh, wow, you know what they're doing? Obviously not. He knows exactly. He's not overwhelmed by what's happening on Earth. He's the sovereign ruler. As a matter of fact, Psalm 103, 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and when the throne is there, it means the guy that's sitting on the throne is in charge. And it says that, and his kingdom rules over all including all of the events of planet Earth and in your life. What happened this week in your life? God's sovereign for that event. And so that means that we can trust because that if God is in control, he will, in the final analysis, accomplish good for us. And if you heard, uh, I think it was Nikki's testimony, that's exactly what she shared in her experience uh, that she said learning that about this was the fact that God ultimately accomplishes good for us. In Job chapter 1, we read the story how that Job loses absolutely everything. Uh, he has all of his wealth, his, his animals, and, and all of his possessions uh, destroyed. Uh, his ten children are all killed uh, in a, a windstorm, and he is left bereft. And uh, it says, at this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell on the ground in worship. Interesting. And it said, he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. He recognized the reality that all of this had happened by the sovereign will of God. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And that's what Job's belief was, that God was sovereign and that God had permitted this to happen in his life, but it was committed also, God was committed, to accomplishing ultimate good in Job's life. Somehow, some way, Job didn't know how, but he believed that. And it's interesting to read how that last verse in, in Job chapter 1 uh, puts it, and it says, and in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. That's what people do. They blame God for letting them down. They think. They get angry at God. They blame God. I just got a text this morning from somebody who said, I'm, I'm angry at God, and I'm angry at you. <laughs> well, uh, I'm in good company, I guess, to have somebody <laughs> angry at God and at me. For the way that God has allowed things to happen in that person's life. And I'm counseling this person. Pray for this person who's, who's so distraught in their life, and I'm trying to help them. Let me ask a question. What bad news have you been handed recently? How do you feel about it? Are you troubled? Is it troubling in your heart what's happening right now? And I give you the simple, quick, but true answer. Trust in God. He's in charge. 
Trust in God. He's in charge. I like the way the psalmist puts it in Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I will trust. I will not be afraid. Well, Jesus then goes on to tell them, not only don't you have to worry, but you've got something to look forward to. And the answer is, it's the promise of a future in heaven with him. And that's why it says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. One of the greatest challenges in life is its ending. We wonder what happens to us when we die. What's going to take place when we walk through death's door? What's, going to, what's it going to be like? Now, for some of us, it's sooner. For others of you, perhaps longer. We don't know. I mean, at any point in time, uh, this could be the last morning you're in church. I'm in church. Who knows? Nobody knows that. And, of course, we all love the beginning of life. And as a grandpa uh, uh, and grandparent, uh, my wife and I, we have been blessed with nine grandchildren. We're so thankful. And we loved the birth of grandchildren. And I, as far as I know, I think we're going to end up with just having nine the way uh, things are shaping out. And uh, we love that. You love to hear the birth of a baby. And Nikki has a uh, little Adeline there. Uh, uh, what did she say? Seven weeks old? Seven weeks old. What, how wonderful is that? And I, I think, Cece, you were quite happy to have a, uh, a uh, granddaughter, right? It was a, it was a joy uh, for that. But you know, it's the ending of life that we struggle with more. And one of the reasons we do struggle is because a lot of people don't know what happens to them when they die, and so they fear death. Some even so fear death that they hate even thinking about it, won't even talk about it. They say that Qu Shi Huang, the emperor of China, from 220 to 210 BC would not allow anybody, he was so fearful of death, he wouldn't allow anybody to even use the word death in his presence. Um, the same thing was said of Louis the 15th of France. He would not allow anybody to talk about death in his, in his presence. And the reason for this anxiety and fear and unwillingness to confront this reality is because it's, it's rooted in the worry that death becomes the absolute cessation of existence. That's the fear, the cessation of existence. One of the sitcoms that um, I've watched from time to time is, is uh, the one featuring Kelsey Grammer, who plays the lead role in one of the lead roles in the movie The Jesus Revolution. Well, in his sitcom called Frasier, one of the um, um, uh, episodes called Death Becomes Him, they're talking about death and somebody close to the family has died and they're, they're talking about it. And Frazier, the character, makes the significant comment and he says this, and I, I never forget when I heard him say that, he said, I fear that death will be nothingness. And that's uh, one of the reasons that many people dread the thought of death, the nothingness, the fact that, that it's the end. It's, there's nothing more afterwards. It's tout fini. It finishes there. And uh, that's why, again, another reason why so many people fear the death of a loved one, because they have absolutely no assurance that they will ever see that loved one again. That, they, that loved one is gone forever. And maybe that's how you feel about death and you dread the, your death and the death of one of your loved ones, too. But I want to say to you, if you're, that's your anxiety, and those of you watching online, maybe some of you right now, that's what exactly you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Jesus reassures us that if we believe in him, notice that conditional, if we believe in him, that's conditional, we have nothing to fear. And that's because we have the hope of a future place that in his text he calls his father's house. We call it also heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Paul writes, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, talking about our bodies, he used the image of that, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, living here on earth, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. And so that hope and that anticipation for us as believers is what drives us and carries us and keeps us as we go through life. 
Now, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, or, as I said, rooms. And, uh, as I said, the word mansions is found in the King James Version of the Bible. And what uh, Jesus is saying is that this house has, uh, uh, and these rooms, which already exist, he's in, in preparation of it, uh, if, if you would, it, it is a palace. It's almost like that's the concept with many rooms, and to each person is assigned a room. That's kind of the concept behind that. Back in 2006, my son Curtis and I uh, were on our way to Ethiopia. Um, <coughs> Curtis had worked as a missionary in Ethiopia, and uh, we were able to fly from um, uh, Winnipeg uh, through Toronto on to London. We had to spend a day in London, and that later that evening we flew uh, over to Ethiopia. And uh, so he and I had uh, the opportunity to spend the day in London. We left the airport, we took the uh, train into the city, and went to Buckingham Palace. Here's a picture of all of us. And they say that Buckingham Palace has 775 rooms. It includes 19 state rooms, 52 royal and guest bedrooms, 188 staff bedrooms, 92 offices, and 78 bathrooms. <laughs> now, when Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms, what he's saying simply is that there is room for all. Room for all. As a matter of fact, heaven will be a large place. If we take the teaching of the book of Revelation literally, and I do, like some people don't, but I do, and it says in Revelation chapter 21, 16, describing heaven, the new Jerusalem, it puts it this way, and the city was perfectly square, as wide as it was long, and the angel measured the city with his measuring stick, it was 1,500 miles long, and was as wide and as high as it was long. So, uh, that size would be 396,000 stories if you allowed 20 feet per story in that uh, facility. And the idea, it, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, height, width, and, and, uh, and length. Uh, all three dimensions, and it's, it's like a cube, is what it's saying. Do you know how many people a city that size could accommodate? It's 49 and a half pentillion people. That's 49 followed by 18 zeros. That's probably more than Ralph Eichler has in his bank account. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting for me to notice that there are a lot of people who don't believe in heaven at all. I talked to a guy a few years ago, a couple of years ago, whatever. And, and I asked him, if you died tonight, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? I oftentimes use that question when I'm witnessing to people because it's a good starter. It gets people thinking about eternity. And I asked him that question. And I, I asked him, and you know how he responded to me? He said, and I quote, I'm not so sure I believe that there is such a place as heaven. Stephen Hawking uh, was an, an immensely intelligent man and uh, I came across a article online entitled, it was actually Stephen Hawking, Heaven is, quote, a fairy story. And in this article, and it said this uh, in the article, Hawking told the Guardian's Ian Sample that he believed there is no afterlife and that the concept of heaven is a fairy story for people who fear death. And Hawking went on to say, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its compute components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. Now, if I was talking to Stephen Hawking, of course he's passed away now, if I were talking to him, I, and I would, I'd say this to you, how did Stephen Hawking know there is no heaven? He didn't know any more than I do, than you do. I mean, just because he's very intelligent in one area doesn't mean he knows what happens after death. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen after death. And he doesn't have any insight that nobody else has. And, uh, so when he says it's like a computer, well, it's maybe not like a computer. Because that can be true of computers, but certainly not true of the way God has created us in his image. But the text goes on to say if we believe that uh, this place, heaven, is really there because Jesus, that's why we believe it. Because Jesus himself has told us all. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Notice that? I would have told you. Now, if someone like Stephen Hawking disagrees with me about heaven, uh, whoops, then I have to decide in my thinking, 
Am I going to believe this guy or am I going to believe Jesus? That's the question I then have to wrestle with because this guy says that there is no heaven. How does he know? And then Jesus says there is. And so I'm betting on Jesus rather than on any person I've ever talked to or probably will talk to. That's where I, I, I believe. Indeed, there are a lot of witnesses to this reality of heaven. There are some who claim that what they have what they term today NDEs, near-death experiences, uh, to have been to heaven and seen it. I remember my cousin Jim tell, telling me how he was on the operating table, and he said he died uh, on the operating table, and he said he, he was transported into heaven. He said, I saw my mom and my sister, uh, and he said to me, you know, Henry, I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. I came across a book by Dr. Eben Alexander uh, entitled Proof of Heaven. He's a neurological surgeon from Harvard Medical School for the last 25 years. And uh, in his case, he came down with a severe case of bacterial uh, meningitis caused by a E. coli infection, and that affected his brain, and he went into a coma. Now, uh, he was a committed atheist at this point in time in his life. He had no time at all for anything religious in his life. And then he came down with this sickness, and he ended up in a coma. And they say many people who are in that coma will, uh, uh, longer than 48 to uh, 72 hours, never recover. They will become vegetables or they'll actually die. Well, in his case, after seven days, he awoke and had no adverse effects. And uh, his doctor made this comment, Dr. Scott Wade, despite prompt and aggressive treatment for his E. coli meningitis, as well as care in the medical intensive care unit, he remained in a coma six days and hoped for a quick recovery faded, mortality over 97%. And then on the seventh day, the miraculous happened. He opened his eyes wide, became alert, and went on to have a full recovery. Now, there are a lot of uh, neurologists who do not believe that this actually happens, but that it's an event that takes place in the brain. In the Scientific American, for example, um, Chris Koch writes about these near-death experiences, and he simply says, it tells us how the brain operates. And he says, and I quote, as a scientist, I operate under the hypothesis that our thoughts, memories, uh, precepts, and experiences are uh, electable consequence of the natural causal powers of our brain rather than any supernatural ones. The premise has served science and is handmaking technology extremely well over the past few centuries. Unless there is extraordinary, compelling, objective evidence to the contrary, I see no reason for abandoning this assumption. And what he is saying here, Koch is saying, that as a neurologist, I don't believe that these near-death experiences where people say they've been to heaven and seen heaven, like my cousin Jim, uh, actually happen. It's just something that happens in the brain. It's the way the brain functions at uh, the end of life. Now, in Dr. Alexander's life, in his book, he points out that after he recovered as a neurologist, he then went and looked at his own medical charts. And he said that he came to the conclusion that this event could not have happened only in his brain because he said that part of the brain called the neocortex needed to produce such an experience was for him at that point in time not functioning. And he says, and I quote, Without a functioning neocortex, the limbic system could not produce visions with the clarity and logic I had experienced. Everything, the uncanny, uncanny clarity of my vision, the clearness of my thoughts as pure conceptual flow, suggests higher, not lower brain functioning. And my higher brain had not been around to do that work. And so what he's saying as a neurologist, it's impossible for it to be a, an event simply in the brain, because to have that event happening in the brain has to be done by the neocortex, and the neocortex in that type of situation is dead. And he said he was dead. The interesting thing, he said that as he was going through the experience, he kept hearing over and over, from oh God, you were loved, you were loved, you were loved, you were loved, you were loved. Well, the purpose of Jesus is going to heaven the Father's house was to prepare a place for us. And uh, the primary purpose was to make ready for uh, these disciples and us the ultimate reception in heaven where there will be no more departures or farewells. 
Now, when he said, I go to prepare, we kind of think like when company's coming to our house and we get the table ready and we get everything ready to go and we set it up so that when people come, we can serve them. And I like this artist's uh, uh, picture of this that I found online. Now, this other thing I want to say about heaven is that it will be a beautiful place. Revelation 21 2 says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I have con conducted probably around 200 weddings in my lifetime, and I have yet to see an ugly bride. Mm -hmm. They're all beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that's, I like the imagery there. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 9, however, as that is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, but God has prepared for those who love him. You can't imagine how beautiful. I like the way somebody put it. If, God, if Jesus made this world in six days and how beautiful it is, then imagine how much more beautiful what he's been preparing for 2,000 years. I like that. A little girl and her father were out looking at the sky on a starry night, and the little girl looked up at the sky and said, Father, I've been thinking that if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what will the right side be like? <laughs> and so Jesus reassures us, don't be upset, because he will come back and take us to be with him. And he said, then, if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again. He came once, he's coming back. The second coming, we call it. Zechariah says, and on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. Here's a picture that I took of the Mount of Olives that I was standing and looking east when I took this picture. Now, I've kind of put in my own uh, picture in the background there. But the idea here is the fact that Jesus will physically reappear on planet Earth at that spot. When I was in Jerusalem just about a month ago, I remember thinking, well, what would be great if he came up? I would be so excited. First Thessalonians 4 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's the Greek word arpazo, which is translated in, in Latin rapturo, from which we get the word rapture. We will be raptured up to meet them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. That's the rapture that we have to look forward to, as Paul describes there in 1 Corinthians. And you know, going to heaven will be like coming home. Back when I was in Bible college, I remember the first semester I was away from home for the first time for an extended period of time, and a little uh, memorial of love in the suit of in Saskatchewan. And my parents lived north of Yorkton and Steen in Saskatchewan, and I remember I had my old 56. Uh, she had, and I was driving, and I remember thinking the closer I got to home, the faster I drove. And I, I remember thinking I was so excited to get home, because I'd been away for about three months, and I remember thinking I'll get to see my mom and my dad, and my, my sisters, and my friends, all the people at church, and I was so excited. And that's the way it's going to be like for you when you get to heaven. It's going to be like a homecoming. Um, uh, the psalmist said, you, you will keep guiding me all my life, and with your wisdom and counsel, and afterwards you will receive me into the glories of heaven. And heaven won't be a lonely place. It will be a place where there will be rich fellowship. Uh, it says that the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And we will be able to see uh, Peter, Moses, Jonah, Abraham, all of those who died and gone before. There will be great reunions when we arrive. We'll see... I'll see my mom and dad. Mom died 2001, dad died 2004. We will re be reunited. And that's the hope we have for the future. And if it, you're a child of God, that's the kind of future that you have to look forward to. I like this t-shirt I saw somebody uh, put up. In my father's house are many mansions. I hope yours is next to mine. I told Linda that. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to live in my mansion. <laughs> be encouraged as you think about this future for you if you're a child of God you have a great future to look forward to and if not today would be a great time to ensure that you do because the question I want to conclude with is there a mansion being prepared for you thank you Lord for your word thank you that it teaches us about heaven and that in our your uh, Father's house, there are many mansions you've gone to prepare for us. We look forward to someday being there, but in the meantime, we want to be faithful serving you. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning who has no assurance that if they die tonight, they would go to heaven, there's doubt in their mind. I pray that today they will take that step 
of opening the door of their hearts and asking Jesus to come in and make them their personal Savior. And with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, why don't you do that right now? Would you open the door of your heart, ask him to come in, guarantee yourself one of those rooms in, your, in our Father's house. And you can pray a prayer like this. Dear Lord, say it quietly in your heart. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I ask him to come into my heart, forgive my sins, and become my Savior. Thank you for coming into my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer and sincerely meant it, Jesus came into your heart, you're guaranteed a home in heaven. I'm, I have no doubt that you'll be there with us because you've taken that step of faith, believing in Jesus. Father, for those who pray today, make them feel the sense of your presence in a real way this morning. And we thank you for providing for us an eternity with you that we can look forward to. And we are excited about that whenever it will happen for us. In your name we pray. And everybody said, <laughs> Amen.